made me do it, all right? The devil made me do it. I'm going to, before I get into the, the sermon today, I want to tell you a, a, a story I heard. Um, it was this couple, amen, and this husband and his wife, and after reviewing their finances, let me say now, this couple was not Pastor Washington and Sister Washington, amen. Let me say that up front, amen. I ain't getting myself in no trouble. After this couple had reviewed their finances, amen, uh, they decided it was time that they needed to tighten up on their finances. They needed to spend less and they needed to save more money. So a day later, the wife was out shopping and found the dress of her dreams. Oh, Lord, boy, I tell you, the women can find the dress of their dreams over and over and over again, amen. But the dress cost a lot of money, cost way too much. But she just had to have that dress, amen. So when she showed it to her husband, he said, now, wait a minute. After all that we've already talked about, about spending less money, how in the world could you go out and buy this dress? And so the wife said to him, she said, honey, the devil made me do it. Amen. So the husband asked, he said, well, did you tell him, Satan, get thee behind thee and leave me be? And the wife said, honey, I did. And then he said, girl, it looks even better from the back. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you all recall, those of us that um, have been around for a little while, there was a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson. Amen. Remember, Flip Wilson had that uh, show that would come on. I think it would come on on Saturday nights. And he had this character named Geraldine. Amen. And uh, Geraldine Jones it was her name. And Geraldine was actually Flip who had dressed up like a woman. Y'all remember that, right? Amen. And so every time Geraldine would say something that she didn't have any business saying or do something that she didn't have any business doing, the first thing she'd say is, the devil made me do it. Amen. Amen. Just like Eve did. Just like Adam did. Adam blamed Eve. Amen. No, in fact, Adam blamed Eve and God. Amen. Adam said, that woman you gave me. Amen. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Whether you've blamed somebody, whether you've ever blamed the devil, you've probably blamed somebody else other than the devil. Every last one of us, unfortunately, we play the blame game. Nobody wants to take responsibility for their sin. Amen. If you commit sin, that is your sin that you committed. Amen. And we realized this morning, amen, that sin is embarrassing. It's shameful. It's disappointing. Amen. And we can all identify in some way with our first parents, Adam and Eve, here in chapter 3 of Genesis. Adam and Eve both wanted to avoid responsibility as much and as long as they could. But church family, we must know and realize that when we avoid that responsibility of our sins, we don't get any better. Amen. We, it, it takes away the ability, amen, for us to have a right relationship with God. So we can't find healing and forgiveness. We can't find restoration, amen, if we continue to, blame, to play the blame game. As I recall in the text today, as I said earlier, we, we've got Eve blaming the serpent. Amen. Then you got Adam coming along saying, well, God, it was that woman that you gave me. Now, he's blaming God for, give, for giving him Eve, and that's what caused him to eat of the forbidden fruit. Everybody's blaming somebody else. Amen. Everybody's blaming somebody else. But today, we, we our hope today is, is to go over a couple of things, amen, to accept each and every, to, to help each and every one of us assume responsibility for our sins and quit blaming other people when you mess up, amen. amen. First, and for, first and foremost, you got to confess your sin to God, amen. amen. Now, when you mess up, you need to fess up. Okay, see, I, let, let's see let, me, let, me, let me. When you mess up, you need to fess up. Amen? 
Commit your, listen, admit your sin to God. Confess your sin to God. To confess means to agree with. You say to God, you know what, God, you were right and I was wrong. I agree with you that I crossed the line. I trespassed. I missed the mark that you have for me. I, I messed up bad. As soon as the Holy Spirit convicts you of, of sin, confess it to God. Confess it to God. Adam and Eve put their own desire above what God wished and wanted for them. They thought that they knew better than God. And see, that arrogant belief is what's behind every sin that we commit. Note what they said in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, some of us are just like that. We believe that we can hide from our sin. Amen. Just because people don't know what you've done. Amen. You, 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 have, conf you have been putting on a front for so long that you are now beginning to, to believe your own nonsense, your own craziness. Amen. That you have committed a sin. Amen. And because nobody else knows about it and ain't nobody else talking about it, you don't even believe God knows. Well, I got news for you. He knows. He knows every single thing. He knows every, 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 every follicle of hair on your head. Amen. Every single thing that you've done, every single thing that you think about doing, every single thing he knows. You're not getting by. You're not getting by God. Now, you may get by man with that. But you're not going to get by God with it. We're hiding from God. Trying to hide from God. Because we're able to do it. With man. See we can dress up. Amen. We can look good. We can smell good. Lord have mercy. We can even sound good. And still be up to no good. Amen. Hiding. Hiding. Hiding from God. Hiding from the sin. Is the exact opposite of fessing up and confessing to what you've done. You know, it's, it, it's kind of a, it was kind of a comical scene, a funny scene when you think about it. They're going to hide from God. Amen. Adam and Eve are going to hide from God as if he didn't know where they were, as if he didn't know how to find them. Psalms 139 says that there is nowhere we can go where God is not already there. Amen. Adam and Eve had already made some leaf coverings for their bodies. So their sin had led them to feel shame. They didn't even know what shame was until they ate of that fruit. Amen? So now they are ashamed. Now instead of bringing their shame to God, they tried to run away from God, just like many of us. I, I need you to understand those of you all who might, be, who might be wrestling with some sin or wrestling with something that you've done. Listen, the shame of your sin has already been paid for. Amen. It, pay, it was paid for on that cross on Calvary. And so you have no, no reason, you have no business worrying about the shame of what you've done because Jesus has already taken that to the cross with you. Amen. Bringing shame. They brought shame. They brought shame to God and tried to run from God. Church family, we can't run from him. Jonah just like Jonah, Adam and Eve thought that they could outrun God. Some of us think the same thing. You think we can outrun God. You can't outrun him. Instead of running from God, church family, we ought to think about running to God. We need to run into God's arms like the prodigal son did when he returned home and discovered his father rushing out to meet him with love. See, that's what happens when you and I, when we confess, we bring our sin to God. See, God is more than ready to hear our confessions. And, and, and church family, I'm going to tell you, you'll feel a whole lot better when you get that thing off of you. But confession, confession is not enough. You also need to repent. You got to repent. You got to repent of your wrongdoing. See, this is the difference between feeling sorry for what you did and taking steps not to do it again. Amen. That's called repentance. Amen. 
While confessing means agreeing with, repenting means turning away, turning away from. I think in the military they says about face, amen? It means to turn away, to turn around. To repent is to turn away from your sin and to turn back to God. Repenting is taking full, responsi full responsibility for your sin and throwing yourself at the mercy of of the one true living and holy God. Now this is the exact opposite, amen, of what Adam and Eve did. See, when God finally caught up with them and asked them about their sin, they both shifted the blame, amen. Instead of taking responsibility and repenting, they blamed somebody else. The man said, the woman you, 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 you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. He's blaming God and Eve. Blaming both of them. Eve, in verse 13, she says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. She blamed the serpent. She blamed the serpent. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for what they had done. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, shifted the blame to someone or something else. The devil made me do it. Amen. Today we might hear my parents ruined me. That's why I'm so messed up. Or my temper is just out of control. I, I, you know, I just can't control my temper. Or it's just my personality. That's just the way I am. Or you know what? My all-time favorite, well, they, they shouldn't be pushing my buttons. Amen. I can't help it if they make me mad. Amen. Or if, you know, that's just how... You know, that's just how I am. That's just who I am. You know, people need to accept me the way I am. Well, people might expect you, may accept you the way that you are, but is God going to accept you the way that you are? Amen. Yet God calls us to follow him, to follow him without excuse. And when we fail, he doesn't condemn us. He calls us out lovingly. He says, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? And God, and God calls us to be accountable for our sins so we can bring those sins to him. In this garden story, as bad as the punishment got, if you read the rest of the story, God only cursed the serpent and the ground. The man still would make a living, although weeds would make it hard. The woman still would be blessed through childbirth, although it would be painful. And the two still would have each other, although some control issues would enter into the relationship later on. But anyway, that's another story, amen, for another day. Yet there's so much grace here, so much forgiveness. God had told them, if you eat of this fruit, you surely will die. But they didn't die. They began to age, but they had many more years ahead of them. If you read the rest of this chapter, even though God evicted them from the garden, he still provided them with animal skins, the first time in the Bible we see innocent die to cover the sins of the guilty. And all of this happened even though Adam and Eve didn't bring their sin to God. How much quicker the process when we become quick confessors and quick repenters. Which brings me to my next point. Receiving God's forgiveness. Amen. We have to receive God's forgiveness. Right here in the third chapter of the Bible, we see God's forgiveness plan for the entire human race. It was wrapped up in verse 15 where God says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This little verse, this little verse is the first gospel because it promised a savior, a descendant of Eve who will, who will deal the serpent a death blow. See, if somebody strikes your heel, it will slow you down. But if somebody crushes your head, then you're dead. Note the word offspring, some English Bibles translated as seed. Amen. It's singular. The verse is talking about one specific member of Eve's family tree. He will crush your head. Although there will be enmity between women and serpents in general, this particular descendant will strike a death blow. Not on the serpent family, but on this one serpent in particular. 
He will crush his head and he will strike his heel. Who, who are they talking about? They're talking about the one and the only Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 16 and 20, he writes, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Who? Satan, that great deceiver, that fallen angel, the, herd, the head worship leader in heaven who thought he was better than God. Listen to what the Apostle John foresaw in Revelation. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The New Testament writers had no doubt who the serpent in the garden was. And they had no doubt who this descendant of these was. The God of peace, amen, as Paul described him, is Christ our Lord, the Son of God, the descendant of David, born of a human by the Virgin Mary, tracing his lineage all the way back to Adam and Eve. He is, Jesus is, amen, our source of forgiveness and our way to eternal life. Lastly, James 4 and 7 says this. If you want to know, amen, how to quit allowing, amen, the devil to get you to do things that you have no business doing, James 4 and 7 has the answer. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Amen. Resist the devil and he will flee. There's two things we must know and remember. Satan is always on the attack. Even though we know the truth of this from God's word, we mostly don't realize it happening. Satan is always on the attack. Even when he has left you alone, he hasn't left you alone. Amen. He's backing up and regrouping to try to figure out how he's going to come back at you the next time. Secondly, Church family, Christians, saints, we have all the power, to, power and authority from God to resist the devil and make him run away from us. Therefore, these two facts need to become our constant companions, amen, that Satan is constantly on the attack and that we have the power, amen, to fight Satan and resist him. We are not of this world, but we are in it for a time as God's ambassadors. That means that most of the world is playing by a set of rules dictated by Satan himself. Things such as pride, fear, envy, lust, and hatred make this world go around. And if Christians are unaware of the weaknesses of our own flesh, then we will be just as susceptible to his ways and schemes as Adam and Eve were. But it doesn't have to be that way, church family. To truly combat Satan and live a victorious, a victorious life in the present age, we can still, we can still beat Satan because we have the power, amen, to beat Satan. Amen. We have the power to beat Satan. We have to submit ourselves to God. Don't fall for the easy stuff that says because you prayed a prayer once and asked Jesus into your heart that you never need to worry about going to hell, or that is that, and that's all there is to be, being a Christian. No, 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 no. Satan loves people who think like that. No, you have to be in constant prayer. Amen. Satan loves for people to believe that, that because it leaves them powerless. He wants you to believe that. No, you got to be in constant prayer. Those who truly believe God and, tru and truly believe his word will have no choice but to lay down their lives for God. Surrender to God. That's the path of life everlasting. The degree to which you do this will determine your experience of the abundant life. Then it says, then, then, submit yourself, then. James 4, James powerfully explains the reason that people, both unbelievers and believers, fight. He says we lust after things that we aren't getting, and so we want to murder. Amen to cover it up. Remember Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother because of jealousy and envy. This is both hard to understand and accept, but it's true. Jealousy, envy, 
Church family, resist the devil. And he will. He will flee from you. But you must realize that Satan and the other devils are behind much of our sin. He whispers a lie or accusation. We listen to the thought. Our emotions get triggered. We react to these satanic emotions, and then we sin. Amen? I tell people all the time that Satan messes with you with your, with your past. Amen? Because he can only control you through your past. He's got very little influence on your present. And God is in control, amen, of your future. Quit letting Satan mess with your mind about stuff that has happened in the past. Amen. Let the past be in the past. Amen. It's a shame. It's a shame that we have the ability to resist the devil and we won't do it. And all we have to do is just submit ourselves to God and allow God to take every one of our thoughts captive, as it says in 2 Corinthians. We have to learn to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ to whom has given himself for each and every one of us. Church family, I, I promise you, Satan will flee you if you resist. His greatest lie is that we cannot resist him. Reject that lie and live a life with God. So church family, as I prepare to take my seat this morning, I ask you, I ask you, I ask you this morning that we quit saying, amen, that the devil made me do it. Because see, God has given us free will and we must begin to exercise that in a godly way. James 4 and 7, again, I say, says resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will do what? He will flee. We do not have the power on our own to make the devil flee from us. We must have the Holy Spirit residing deep down within us. That's what will help us to, to fight the devil and, and, and give us the ability to get the devil to flee from us. Satan, get thee behind me and leave me be, is what we should be saying when those thoughts enter into our minds and those thoughts enter into our hearts, those things that we know that are not pleasing to God. We should be saying more and more and more, Satan, get thee behind me and leave me be. We know when we're getting ready to do something or say something that we ain't got no business doing or saying. But my advice to you this morning, church family, as I prepare to take my seat, is that when you get into those kinds of situations, when you're going through those kinds of trials and tribulations, I ask you this morning to just remember this one simple thing, that if God, if you don't have the words right then to be able to talk your way through it in a godly way, then I ask you to just do this one simple thing. Just call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus when you're confronted with those things, when you're confronted with those thoughts in your minds, when you're confronted with those things in your heart. Call on the name of Jesus. When people are getting on your nerves and trying you, call on the name of Jesus. When people begin to test you and try your patience, call on the name of Jesus. Even when hell is on your back, call on the name of Jesus. When people are placing stumbling blocks in your way, call on the name of Jesus. When, when, when they're devising evil schemes against you, church family, learn to call on the name of Jesus. Don't let anybody cause you to put your religion down. You call on the name of Jesus first. Oh, I found that there's power in the name of Jesus. I found that there's healing in the name of Jesus. I found that there's deliverance in the name of Jesus. I found that there's peace in the name of Jesus. I found that there's joy in the name of Jesus. I found that there's love in the name of Jesus. So when the devil is tempting you this morning, church family, I need you to just do this one simple thing. I need you to learn how to call on the name of Jesus. Oh, I dare you right now to call on Jesus, to just call out the name of Jesus three times where you're sitting at or where you're standing at. Oh, because I promise you, if you call on him right now, you'll feel something going on in you. You'll feel something being delivered from you. Oh, you'll feel chains 
being broken. So I ask you right now to just join me right now and let's call on the name of Jesus all together at three, at three different times. Are you ready, church family? Are you ready, church family? Are you ready, church family? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, yes, did you feel that? Oh, let's do that one more time. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Call on the name. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Oh, I even heard those babies back there hollering Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of blood. Born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Oh, yes. I don't want to hear nobody saying the devil made me do it. Amen. 